Let's come to God's word now. We're going to read from John chapter 6, beginning at verse 32. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. This is God's word. We're returning this morning to John chapter 6. And as we think of what has gone before, the, the, the miraculous feeding of the 5,000, the, the journey across the lake, and then the people coming to Jesus, and Jesus being quite blunt and, and saying, you followed me here because, because of the bread you received. But Jesus has to make very clear to them that what he has come to do what he has come to give is not simply to provide for them physical sustenance, but something for their souls. Now we've read from verse 32 to 40. There is so much in this passage and this morning I want to give, as it were, a flyover view. And then over the coming weeks we'll begin to unpack some of the great themes that are here, themes of theology a very practical theology for you, for me. Themes of challenge, themes of hope, themes of assurance for all who will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing that I want to draw to your attention here is the number of times Jesus speaks of himself as I. I say to you. Jesus knows his identity. He is the Son of God. He is the great I Am. A time when Moses, for instance, was encountering God at, at the burning bush and, he, and, and instructed to go to, to, to the Hebrew people in Egypt. And he said, who will I say sent me? He said, tell them I Am sent you. Every time we encounter the words of Jesus, as we do specifically in verse 35 here, I am the bread of life. We are reminded of that divine identity. So notice with me, first of all, the divine revelation that we find in these verses, which we have read. Verse 32, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you. This is God revealing his mind, his purpose to us in language, in speech. In fact, later on in verse 36, Jesus says, But I said to you. We have a God who reveals himself not in mysteries, but in language that we can understand. For many centuries, the truth of God was hidden from the people, restricted only to languages they could not understand, specifically the language of Latin. But from the, the, the 13th, 14th century onward, people began to, to translate the word of God 
into the language of the people. They could understand what God is saying. They could hear what God is saying. And many of them paid for that labour with their lives. To make God's word accessible. Why? Because they believed that God has spoken. And friends, that is why you will hear me so often when I finish a reading of a passage of scripture saying, this is the word of God. We must never forget that the scriptures that we have are the very word of God, a God who speaks to us. And there are times when people say, oh, I wish I could hear God's voice. I, I, wish, I wish God would speak to me when all we have to do is open up a Bible and as John Piper once said, I hear God speak audibly to me every morning because I open up the scriptures and read them out loud. We hear God speak in the scriptures. He reveals himself to us in the scriptures. And in these first few verses of a reading this morning, Jesus is really addressing this matter of of the desire of the people to have bread. They, they received it on the hillside, and now they're following them. They're looking for more. And of course, the, the issue of Moses and the food in the desert, the manna has come up. But Jesus says, it wasn't Moses who gave you that bread from heaven, it was God who gave you it. But my Father, says Jesus, is giving you the true bread from heaven. And what is that? It is the very one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. It is not simply a product as bread would be. It is a person in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world, as verse 33 says. And how did they respond? Sir, give us this bread always. You know, there's an echo there of, of, of that woman at the, at, at the well. That woman who, who came and was drawing well at mid, the water from the well at midday. And, and Jesus said to her, if you had asked me, I would give you living water. Living water that could truly satisfy your thirst. And, and how did she respond? Oh, give me this water so I don't have to keep coming back to the well. She she was missing the point, just as these people were. She was still hoping for some sort of physical substance, sustenance. When in fact, Jesus was offering something for our souls. Something that could truly satisfy. Having noted the divine revelation in these verses and in all of Scripture as God reveals himself, as God speaks, I want us to see now God's divine provision. I am the bread of life, says Jesus. I am the bread of life. This life that is ours only through him, and look at what he says. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Again, the echo to the woman there in John chapter 4 is so clear. Whether hunger or whether thirst, Jesus says, I will meet your deepest needs. Needs that are not physical but needs that are spiritual friends. People can have their bodies full of, of food and drink and their cupboards and their fridges full and their hearts and souls still be empty and unsatisfied. Now none but Christ can satisfy. No other name but he. There's life and joy and lasting life only found in him. He's that bread of life. But there's a problem. 
They had seen him, as verse 36 says, but they didn't believe. Friends, this offer of bread that satisfies, of the water of life, is for those who will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not simply believe in him as some historical person, but believe in him to be the one who can save them. To trust in him, to rely in him, to take him at his word. And notice what Jesus says. All the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I have come down from heaven. So if we have noted divine revelation, as God reveals us to himself, himself to us, in his word, divine provision, and Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. I will provide for you that deepest need of your souls. We now have that divine incarnation, the God who put on flesh and came to us from heaven. No one has gone up to heaven. But God's own Son, the Lord Jesus, fully God, fully divine, takes on flesh and comes down to us. As we sometimes sing at Christmas, he came down to earth from heaven. What a glorious story of the incarnation. God putting on flesh. Just as the first Adam had sinned and brought upon mankind the curse. As in Adam's sin, all have sinned. God sends a second Adam, his own son. To not only show us what God is like, but to take our sins upon himself, upon the cross. That all who would believe in him would find forgiveness and find life. And that's what Jesus says. Notice he says, whoever comes to me I will never cast out. What a wonderful invitation to come to Christ, to believe in him. And to know that he will receive us. Oh, the religious leaders of his day, they mocked when when they saw Jesus reaching out to people they would have had nothing to do with, they said, he receives sinners. Praise God, he receives sinners, for he would receive me and he would receive you. Should we simply come in believing faith to him? And he will incorporate us into his body, the body of Christ, the believers, his family, Saved by grace. Our sins washed clean through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Incorporated into his family. Notice what he says. I will never cast out. Ought to know that. Think of the child who has gone through foster home after foster home. One place for a little while then somewhere else. Maybe there have been troublesome. Maybe there's been other problems. Just one home after another. And finally a family comes along and says, we will adopt you. What is the difference then? He belongs there. He is family. Friends, there is divine adoption when by God's grace we are brought into Christ Jesus. We are saved. We are born again. And it is in that context that Jesus is able to not only make this word of invitation and say whoever comes to me I'll never cast out but also say that of all of those the father has given him he will lose none so how does this work we see first of all the father's giving 
that will, that purpose decided in eternity past. That out of all the nations, all the tribes, the peoples and languages of this earth, God himself would choose a redeemed people. A redeemed people not chosen for any merit of their own, but simply by his divine grace that would come to know the Lord Jesus as Saviour, that they would be born again by his Spirit, that in repentance and faith they would turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Father would give them to his Son. You know, I love so many of the hymns of Graham Kendrick. Great hymns, wonderful hymns. There's one problem I do have, though, with this hymn, The King is Among Us where he decide, describes Christians as a love gift from Jesus to the Father above. Friends, it's the other way around in Scripture. Believers are a love gift from the Father to his Son. They are more than a love gift. They are his very bride. <laughs> the very bride given to the Son of God. And all that the Father gives me, says Jesus, will come to me. And the Saviour will receive them. Yes, friends, he receives sinful men. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Friends, that is good news. There are those who may imagine, well, if I come to Christ, surely then I must live a perfect, sinless life in order for me to, to stay within this family, to, to remain to remain his, no friends. The one who saves us is the one who keeps us. And how is this keeping brought about? It is kept about not simply by the Father's promise and the Saviour's purchase with his blood, but by the Spirit's power. The Holy Spirit's power who, who seals every believer, who marks us as Christ's. We are his. And not only seals us, but begins to sanctify us and to work in us and to work through us. Making us more like Jesus. And friends, that's a lifelong process. From the day when God in his mercy and grace saved you, until the day when by his spirit he will glorify you. That's a process that never ends. A process of making us more like Jesus. And sometimes some of the sharp edges are ground off or knocked off. It hurts. But he will do what he needs to do sometimes even if through pain to shape and to form the image of his precious son in each of his children. This is our God who does this. But how are we to come into this relationship with God? How are we to be brought in to this new standing, this incorporation, incorporated into his body to be in Christ? Verses that say things like, if anyone's, in anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. To say that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How do we come from being outside of Christ Jesus, which, friends, is the default position. That's the way we're born, outside of Christ. How do we come from outside of Christ to in Christ? Verse 40 tells us, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. Friends, you would read that verse as I would and we would see there an echo to, to John chapter 3. 
to John chapter 3 and verse 16, where whoever God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal, everlasting life. But friends, Jesus even calls us to look before that verse to verse 14 and 15 of John 3, where he says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. You know, on Israel's wilderness wanderings, wandering for 40 years because they had not taken God at his word, and they had rebelled against him and they had complained and moaned about him and his provision for them. And God had punished them and disciplined them by, by sending into the camp a plague of poisonous snakes. But God had said to Moses, Moses, raise up a snake, an image of a snake. Tell the people that when they will look to it, then they will be preserved. And they were. Well, it was not an idol. Moses made clear that this was simply a means, this was an image that God was providing for them to look to him, to cry out to him. And says Jesus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Here at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry is speaking of that day when he would be lifted up and put upon a cross and would suffer the shame and indignation of the mocking of the passers-by and worse than that, infinitely worse than that, he would bear within himself the wrath of God for the sins of men. Not his sins, but the sins of men. Men who, in their very turning away from God, had their indifference toward God, their sin toward God, and wanted nothing to do with him. Yet there on that cross, the Bible tells us, as he would die, he would give himself a ransom for many. And as often said, if the question to your mind right now is how many? As many as would believe on him. Without any number that man could ever place. So that says, is there room at the cross for me? Yes, there's room at the cross for you if you will but simply come and acknowledge your need of a saviour and put your hope and your faith and trust in him. Turn from sin. Turn from any notion that, that somehow you could be saved by your own merit and simply believe on the Lord Jesus and be saved. Not only does Jesus promise in verse 40 that those who do so will have eternal life, but also promises a divine recreation. I will raise him up on the last day. Friends, this earth and our final death is not the end of the story. For even as the Lord Jesus ascended into heaven, the angels proclaimed this same Jesus will return. He's coming back. He himself said, were these things not so? Would I not have said, I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again for you. Well, friends, when the believer in this Life, their life draws to a close. Their, their spirit enters into the very presence of their Saviour. Their body remains and decays by whatever process. But on that last day, when Christ returns, our bodies will be raised 
incorruptible and for those who are Christ's, for those who belong to him, who are his possession, to be brought into his presence for all eternity in new bodies, in a new creation, to know joy forever in his presence. Oh, the scripture also brings a warning. It is not only those who are Christ's who will be raised, for all will be raised. Some to be welcomed into eternal bliss and other to eternal judgment. For there is a choice. Will you believe in him today? Will you look to him? Will you look to the Lord Jesus as the only one who offers life and believe in him and be saved? Be saved. Not only saved for now, not for the years of time alone, but for all eternity. Friends, this is the glorious hope that is ours in Christ. I pray that you know him, that you know him as saviour. Over these coming weeks, as I've said, we're going to unpack in more depth some of these wonderful themes in this passage. But until then, let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that in Christ and Christ alone our salvation can be found. He is all we need. He is the one who feeds us with that living bread, who sustains us, who leads us. Until that day, Father, when indeed our spirits clothed the mortal, wing their flight to realms of day. Oh, what a testimony can be ours as believers that Christ has led us all the way until that day father keep us we pray for jesus sake amen and now friends let's finish this service with that great hymn all the way my savior leads me <laughs>